Right, welcome back. Thank you for that. And uh, next up is going to be our panel. Um, panel is going to be led by Mike Pallett. Um, he's going to show, or his team is going to show tangible ways that you can implement an urban wood policy in your own area, as well as some input from uh, consultants and a manufacturing sector uh, who is using urban wood, which Andy touched on a little bit earlier. Um, and so his, his uh, team is, well, first of all, himself. There's Mike, Vice President, West Coast Arborist. He currently works uh, at West Coast Arborist C overseeing public agency contracts and field operations in Southern California and Arizona. Mike serves as the chairman of the San Diego Regional Urban Forests Council. And on the panel will be Brett Lance, City of Upland. Uh, he has been working in public works for 32 years and has a bachelor's degree from Cal Poly Pomona. Brett is also a pest control advisor, qualified applicator, and a certified arborist. We have John Mahoney from Street Tree Revival. He's an area manager at West Coast Arborist Urban Wood Business, Street Tree Revival. At the intersection of power tools and creativity, John Mahoney, and that's true. If you've ever seen John, he's usually got a chainsaw in his hand, staying dusty. So check out his uh, little video series. Uh, John Mahoney found his niche turning otherwise forgotten urban green wood waste into dazzling works of art. And Alex Ruiz Velasco um, has worked for the city of Chula Vista Office of Sustainability for the past 15 years on various topics ranging from energy management and energy efficiency, and recently environmental services, focusing on recycling and the new state law SB 1383, which um, I suspect, or I am curious as, as this panel unfolds, if SB 1383 had a lot to do with why a lot of cities uh, are starting to get involved in this. Uh, we'll also hear from Mike Bourne with the Urban Wood Economy, Urban Wood Network member, by the way. Um, he has worked in a wholesale hardwood distribution from 1981 to 2011 in both domestic and international markets. Sourcing and procurement is a critical function in matching the right raw material production to the correct end user. He specialized in wood for musical instruments and has in his list of clients, Fender, Leo Fender, at GNL, Rickenbacker, and Taylor Guitar. And uh, Scott Paul, uh, Director of Natural Resource and Sustainability for Taylor Guitars. Scott is the Director of Natural Resource and Sustainability with two planting projects in the works. Taylor's collaboration with partners like West Coast Arborists sheds light on the challenges and benefits of creating a circular urban wood economy around trees. Um, and I've actually had the pleasure of, of uh, seeing some of these urban wood guitars in person that have come out of the project that they've worked with. And so hopefully they'll be touching on that a little bit today. So um, please uh, welcome this great panel and we look forward to hearing what they have to say. Take it away, awesome. Mike, it's all yours. Awesome, uh, thank you, Jennifer. Um, I think fortunately we don't have a PowerPoint. <laughs> so I think that benefits us a little bit in regards to our, our technology glitches that we may run into. So uh, thank you for the introduction, Jennifer. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about this panel. I think uh, it's a good broad contrast spectrum of interactions with the urban wood issues that are happening out there. Uh, I'm gonna start with me. So again, um, I touch urban wood in a lot of ways with uh, my work with West Coast Arborists. And one of the big things is this uh, urban wood policy development that we you know, played a role in. Um, you know, it started, I don't even know, maybe like three or four, three years ago, I was sitting in my kitchen thinking about what would drive the use of urban wood. And it occurred to me that I look at the solar industry and how they've, I'll call it lobbying, if you will, but they've been able to institute uh, rules and regulations that require changes and and in california i guess we have this ability to maybe institute something like that so why not develop an urban wood policy that agencies can adopt to institute changes that otherwise wouldn't exist so um basically that's that's a big part of what we're going to talk about today is this urban wood policy and and you know really 
on action plans being the rage that they are right in the last five to 10 years. And agencies are really pushing forward with those that uh, the timing's pretty good to, to ride that wave a little bit with some of the deliverables of uh, urban wood policy, including that carbon sequestration. So that's, that's really one thing we're trying to glom on is the momentum of climate action plans and, and adopting this policy within that. Uh, additionally, there's a, a little bit of momentum with California Urban Forest Council specifically where there's a grant called the City Forest Renewal Grant in which um, it basically removes, you know, some removing hazardous trees, recycling some of that wood. But one of the other big deliverables is uh, getting agencies to change some of their policies, including adoption of, an urban, of this urban wood policy. Uh, we currently have seven cities that are in the process of it, one of which is the city of Upland, and we have a presenter on this panel from the city of Upland. But uh, basically, the urban wood policy has three main components. Um, the agency, as a policy, agrees to contribute uh, wood to the stream. So if a tree is coming down for the right reasons, that wood, you know, potentially could be, you know, captured in that moment. Not every tree is going to get captured, but um, you know, the city arborist makes that decision and says, yes, this tree meets the criteria that we feel comfortable, you know, procuring that wood. So, you know, start to plan where it's going to go for that recycling process. The second piece of consideration for the policy is end of life use consideration when we plant trees. So identifying, you know, suitable locations for trees that, you know, are going to have a good use of, of at the end of their life. So that's a, that's another um, policy piece. And the third one, which is, I think, a, a big issue that keeps being touched today that, is, is a challenging one is really the funding mechanism behind all of this. End of the day, everybody kind of can get on board with, yeah, let's recycle wood, let's let's plant trees with that end of use life, but how are you gonna fund the use of the wood? And really that that's one of the big missing pieces is, is the funding mechanisms to drive so that we're not just piling up wood and filling up yards with logs that go unused. So um, this policy has that and there's multiple ways of, of funding the use of urban wood. One of the big ones that we're trying to endorse is basically any new construction that takes place, 1% of it will utilize urban wood. That could be for flooring, that could be for furniture. Obviously, it's not going to be for structural purposes, but it could be a variety of ways of fulfilling that obligation of 1%. So that's a good driver of it. So any new construction using it to that, to that degree would help, you know, again, economize the use of the urban wood. The other one is um, perhaps an urban wood mitigation fund. So, if, you know, city trees have to come out for a, a given project or for a given development, you know, protection, you know, obviously doing something with that wood as a way of um, sequestering the carbon. And again, another funding mechanism. And another one is just having a percentage of an agency's fiscal budget uh, be, you know, for the, whether it's their tree maintenance budget or whatever type of budget you want to have, just some agency teeth in the game that's going to help drive the, the economy of urban wood. So that's that's the policy in a nutshell. And I think the perspectives of the folks um, that I'm going to be asking some questions to will help um, maybe frame this whole bigger picture a little bit better. So with that said, um, Chula Vista was a, a group that I, I reached out to with this, with this issue. And uh, Alex, I've known for a little bit, and I know he's he brings an interesting perspective because he comes from the uh, environmental side of things. And and so, Alex, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, and then and then I'm going to ask you a few questions. Okay. So, uh, I don't know if it's muted or not. Yeah, uh, I can hear you. Okay. Um, I'm with the Office of Sustainability with the City of Chula Vista. I was uh, as part of the Office of Sustainability. I used to do energy management. And now I'm doing environmental services, which is recycling and organics and all that uh, fun stuff. Uh, Part of uh, my tasks recently have been to explore the post-life use of trees. And that's one of the reasons I'm here, to awesome. explore the uh, possibilities of developing or expanding on the existing policy we have within the city. Awesome. So, so Alec, what, what was your initial motivation for creating a policy? Uh, well, uh, my boss told me, well, I'm <laughs> uh, no, uh, initially, uh, the state's going through a, a, a new push for uh, mitigating uh, household uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, which are uh, generated from organics. So we're trying to divert as much organic material from the landfill uh, and 
mulch it or compost it so that it goes back into the uh, environment and n in a beneficial way and not a non-beneficial way, which is just burying it and waiting for it to turn into methane, uh, which is a greenhouse gas. Uh, but in a nutshell, that's basically what the push was. Okay. What, uh, what's been your biggest challenge with, you know, moving this policy forward with your city? Uh, trying to define what exactly it is we were going to do. Uh, initially, it started off by kind of developing a, a one-stop shop uh, for urban lumber for the, uh, for the Chula Vista region. But um, it was a little bit outside of our purview and um, our, or our wheelhouse more, more accurately. But now it's, it's mostly focused on uh, post-life use and making sure that we are disposing um, of, of the post of the trees that have been removed in a proper uh, way. Okay. And then uh, what, do, what do you think, uh, what are your expectations if this policy gets adopted? What do you, what do you see changing or what are your expectations with the city of Chula Vista? Uh, they're actually pretty good so far. Uh, we've, we've gotten a lot of uh, positive uh, feedback from the uh, open space uh, people uh, for the, from the city of Chula Vista. They're actually quite on board with it. We're just, we're just uh, trying to, we're having difficulty figure out figuring out what we're going to do with the trees that are uh, removed that have potential value. Uh, that's been that's been the uh, the focal point for the moment. Gotcha. Okay. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you uh, being on this panel. And um, is Brett on the call? I don't necessarily see him. Brett, are you there? I think I might have to come back to Brett. His, uh, I, don't, I don't see him on the panel yet, but I will move over to uh, John, John Mahoney. So John is, uh, was referenced in Andy's presentation. So John is the uh, area manager for Street Tree Revival and, and has been doing this stuff basically his whole life, pretty much. So uh, John, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit? Hello, everyone. It is great to be here. I'm really happy to be here. Like Mike said, I've been doing this my whole life, kind of. So I grew up and saw firsthand all the different, you know, how much wood waste comes through our company being with West Coast Arborist. We are, you know, joined up with so many different cities. Kind of, kind of blew my mind when I grew up how much wood comes out of the urban forest. It's really crazy. So I fell into in love with it and, uh, you know, tried to keep it out of the wood splitter by making carvings. And I think that there's cool opportunities, just like there's uh, money for funding public art. There could be money for funding the use of urban wood could be just like, you know, the public art, how it works like that. And the wood could be used as public art. So that's really, uh, it's really fun. So we've been growing up and, and seeing the, going to the different uh, urban wood network, uh, uh, meetings back in you know as a as a young man and go into the different uh, just really fell in love and uh, now we have some challenges and some things on how to you know to to grow it awesome awesome so John preparing wood for the uh, for the market what how do you plan what is the process basically there so we'd look so as we were talking about earlier one tool that we all have and then one benefit to having inventory is to kind of get a handle on what is coming down in certain uh, pearls that we could try to to capture through the through the waste stream by getting an eye on it as it comes down or looking at the past and saying you know what are the top trees that are being removed what are the values of those so we kind of have gone through that and over the years we've sorted out about 45 different species that we try to track regularly and as they come into the yard some of the um, challenges is it's just learning what the logs look like. You know, we have all these different species and trying to get our crews to to cut down the logs and maybe tag the material has been has been interesting. So really having the sort yard has been really great for us that we've got all the different and space to to sort the species and capture it. 
then we kind of went blind. It takes three years to dry wood. So you kind of have to make some educated guesses and a little bit of a gamble that what you cut now is going to be good in three years. So internally at Street Tree Revival and West Coast, we kind of, after a couple years of doing it, we realized you really have to take care of the wood like a like a sweet little baby, you know, and you have to really, you have to set it up for success the moment it comes into the yard as a log. It's kind of like carrots, you know, we should real logging yards have sprinklers going on the logs to keep the, 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 the logs in good condition. So these logs are like carrots out there and you have to really take care of them. So we've kind of set up our processes so that we have the best success in the in the future so you really have to dot your t's and cross your i's because the lumber is kind of unforgiving so we we saw the wood in special patterns so that we have the best results in the long run and we really try to take care of it and put the put weight on top of the lumber and then we sit and as it and then hopefully it's ready for market our gambles have worked out in that way so we're, we're just trying to dial them in now and uh very cool. Yeah, you bring up market. You know, market definitely likes predictability. We've definitely heard that from Taylor uh, Guitars, which Scott will be coming up here in a minute. But um, how do you deal with this? And um, I mean, there's so many variables with what's being removed every day. How do you deal with that? There are so many variables, and it's almost daunting to try to, you know, when when a big company like Taylor asks you, are you going to have this wood in two years? You know, are you going to have this wood in five years? Is this wood going to be around for a long time? And the first answer is like, you know, we can't can't answer that question because we don't know if it's going to be around. But through inventory and having these data points, we can kind of steer ourselves to make good guesses that, it, you know, these materials will be around. And to look at, you know, like Chinese pistache. I didn't realize Chinese pistache was, you know, such a, a cool wood and, you know, and beautiful wood. We have so many of them. If you looked at Matt Ritter's uh, presentation earlier, it was in the top 10 of, of trees in California. The wood is also super valuable. So we're kind of looking through the data, we're data mining it a little bit, and we're saying, you know, where are we leaking opportunities or what's making it through the chipper? You know, Chinese pistache, those are kind of small trees that could be going through every, every, through our data. And that's helped us to give a more educated guess and then once we got the ball rolling, it's really an internal thing with our crews trying to say, hey, keep your eyes peeled for these certain species, you know, and, and that helps us have some predictability. And it's nice to know that certain species will be sold. So we kind of have to try to, we're still doing salvage, you know, when the logs come in and you're purely salvaging what comes in and sorting it from there. But it is nice to get an idea of when trees are going to be removed that you can know right off the bat that it's going to go into a certain pipeline and, and capture that for for the market yeah it definitely helps to have good data to be able to be predictable um you know one of the things that was brought up um, during matt's presentation is the um shortage of potential trees of, that none of the nurseries carry some of these species that could be an end of use life contract growing how would you, how do you do that? Is that something that you're familiar with doing contract growing? It's the dream. I'm like, think everybody should be doing it. Every city should contract grow and plan out, you know, 10 years in advance to have these really cool, unique species that aren't available. Some policies for uh, some cities have, if the tree gets removed, it has to be planted with a 36 inch box, right? So some have, that's a pretty so, extreme one, but. Oh, or, 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 you know, it has to certain, you know, streets, but if you're not thinking forward and doing contract growing like that, or, you know, plant, you know, you got, it's kind of a weird loop, right? If you have to plant established trees, you have to think in the past. So being able to contract grow these cool, unique species uh, that will thrive over the next hundred years, I think it's essential. I agree. I agree. I, I think we do need to think long-term and I think, um, yeah, that's just the reality. What's not there and how do we get it there? Right? Yeah. Awesome. Very cool. All right. Well, thank you, John. I appreciate you being here. Um, I'm going to move over to Scott. So Scott, you there? You're muted and there you go. Man, you hey, got, there you go. You're, you're not quite a uh, witness protection program today. You're looking a little bit different. I've been working on it. <laughs> okay, good. So uh, Scott is from Taylor Guitars. He's the natural resource director. And uh, Scott, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? So I'm Scott Paul, the Director of Natural Resource Sustainability at Taylor. 
Um, that means I oversee, Taylor has uh, very significant uh, restoration programs with Ebony and Cameroon, Koa in Hawaii. Uh, we're finding our footing um, through Tree San Diego and West Coast Arborists and the California Urban Forest Council and of course CAL FIRE to get into some restoration projects here with urban trees in, in our home state of California. And perhaps why I'm on this call is I'm also the guy three and a half years ago that Bob Taylor asked to go scope out uh, whether or not uh, Taylor Guitars would be able to source wood on a, on a regular basis if it would work from, um, from the urban waste wood uh, to, to incorporate onto the Taylor Guitar line. It's awesome stuff, dude. Appreciate your, uh, you being here. Appreciate what you bring to the table and what you've been bringing to this industry. So uh, Taylor Guitars is awesome. You know, uh, one of the uh, only nationally branded companies utilizing urban wood. How are you able to do this? So first, a little bit about the peculiar, um, you know, wood buying practices of the guitar industry. You know, we have fairly finicky um, needs uh, as an industry. We buy a little bit of wood from an awful lot of places. The, the average acoustic guitar has got five different species that come together, both tropical and temperate, to, um, to, to make an acoustic guitar. Um, and it's a very traditional industry. It's been very, um, uh, it's it sourced wood the same way for, for hundreds of years. And all I can tell you about is, um, Brett, if you can turn your camera off, I'm like hallucinating here. Um, um, you know, what is wood buying going to be like 10 years from now? And, and that's a question on the mind of, of, of guitar makers all around the world. And of course, we don't know, but all we can say is that it's going to be very, very different than it was 10 years ago, or frankly, than it's been for 100 years. We're, we're at a, a historic inflection point from the way our industry has always sourced wood into the way it's going to have to source wood into the future. So that means um, we're looking at um, physical changes to the guitar, uh, mechanical changes to compensate for the fact that we're not going to get gigantic old growth trees um, of any species we want moving into the future. But that also means we're looking at plantation and urban trees and for the first time, uh, I believe that Taylor Guitars is the first nationally branded company to adopt urban wood on a sustained basis. People, of course, have used urban wood for a long time, but um, we have it on dedicated models and hope to have urban wood uh, sourced from Southern California via West Coast Arborists for forever. Um, and what we need to get it done, frankly, we, we searched far and wide and we ended up in our own backyard. West Coast Arborist was the only place we could find anywhere in the world, frankly, that could supply us with what we needed. And it was very convenient that they were right next door. We need three things. We need quality, obviously. We need quantity. And, you know, that, that can, we have wiggle room there, but we need to have some degree of quantity if we're going to use it on a dedicated model moving forward. And we need predictability. And West Coast Arborist's uh, software, it's modeling. You know, there's no promises, but they can give us an indication of how many of what species are spread across the state. And then some educated prediction to the average lifespan and what, what, what is likely to be removed by cities um, in the coming, you know, five to 10 years. So to summarize what we need, this worked because we found a willing partner in West Coast Arborist who was willing to work with us and invest. We're lucky to be in California and in California, everything grows. So in California, everything was planted. So we have an insane diversity of species to explore. And a lot of other parts of the country don't have that luxury. Um, 
And the last, but perhaps most important, West Coast Arbors had a sort yard. They had a place where they brought their wood that was identified as perhaps having end of life value. It was separated by species, separated by quality. The, the ends were sealed after the partnership started. You know, they built shade structures. They were keeping them wet. They started to protect the wood in a way that made it make sense for us. So I think those are the, the kind of nutshell of w why it worked is working and why, frankly, West Coast Arbors at the moment is the only company we can find to make the commitment towards um, an urban wood investment. Well, we appreciate the relationship. We've learned a lot from you through this process for sure. Um, so Taylor sources small amounts of wood all over the world. Is urban wood from right next door the cheap, cheaper to source than, than other opportunities? No, we, we, we get that a lot. And I, I uh, a comment made earlier about how municipalities, when they see, oh, someone's buying this wood, they, they, they want more money for it. Um, and the truth is that sourcing urban wood is far more expensive and far more complicated for us than it is sourcing from traditional places. We can get wood from other countries cheaper and easier than we can get um, urban wood from LA County. Uh, and that's because the infrastructure, the chain of custody is extremely mature. Uh, West Coast Arborists and Taylor Guitars and another player, Pacific Rim Tone Woods, the three businesses are, are kind of making it up as we go along and investing where we need to build an infrastructure to achieve efficiencies but right now, everyone's just like, oh, you're using a, a guitar that was destined for firewood or mulch uh, locally. You know, why, why, why is it so expensive, you know, for your guitar? And the truth is that urban wood is far more expensive at this moment than traditional sources. But it's worth it to us because we know what the next 10 or 20 years of wood buying is going to be like and getting in early in figuring out and understanding urban wood, we believe is, is very strategic for our company. Very cool. So as a manufacturer uses urban wood, what comments or questions do you have for the community of people trying to grow this market, which is everybody in this, at this workshop pretty much? Well, I, I think, I think that the move, there is no wrong answer to the question I'm going to pose, but I think the movement in general needs to figure out what it, like what it's trying to grow up into, it, it seems to be dominated at the moment for very logical reasons by players who cut the tree, do the primary processing, build a product and sell a product. And we're a company that would just plain wants wood. You know, we want wood to certain specifications. And there's a huge kind of uh, craftsman artisan rough slab table thing going on which is wonderful i think it's super cool um but a couple of decades ago queen anne furniture was all the rage people couldn't get enough of it and then it wasn't and i i don't think the urban wood movement should be so heavily focused on creating a finished product and trying to sell it and have it all be the live edge look and feel. I think there's a tremendous possibility to playing to make good old fashioned wood that end users like Taylor Guitars or Room and Board or architects looking for some unique look and feel in their lobby. Um, and I'm not talking about a finished product. I'm, I'm talking about sawn wood. And I think there's money to be made uh, if they um, they move in that direction. And, and the last thing I'll say is cliche, the public reaction when we tell this story, and of course this story is we need to plant more trees, we need to maintain those trees. Um, you know, the planting is the easy, easy part, the maintenance apparently is the hard part. Um, that's crucially important, but when a tree must come down, we have to, to create jobs and hopefully create a circular economy that can tie back into the planting of trees. The, that public response has been overwhelming 
you know, the, 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 luckily the wood is good. The, the shamel ash and the red iron bark eucalyptus and the walnut and the um, uh, Tasmanian blackwood that we're finding through West Coast Arborists, it, it's good wood. And if it wasn't good wood, we wouldn't be here. But the public response um, surpassed all expectations. So I think it's there for the taking. And I would encourage the movement to look beyond gorgeous, beautiful tables and benches and think about uh, making some wood. Very cool. Yeah, you, you, it's, uh, I've been paying attention to the movement and it's to be featured in Rolling, this story to be featured in Rolling Stone magazine is a pretty big deal. So pretty awesome. Well, very cool. Well, thank you, Scott. Appreciate you being here. Uh, I'm going to circle back up to Brett, uh, back to a city perspective. I think we got the technology worked out here, Brett. So uh, Brett's from the city of Upland. Um, so Brett, could you give us a little bit of info on who you are? So hi, I'm, I'm Brett Lance. Um, I'm operations supervisor in public works and also uh, the city arborist. I've uh, been here four and a half years and um, it's an older city. Upland was incorporated in 1904. Um, There's about 66,000 people and we have a really super dense urban forest here with a lot of mature trees, um, oaks, a lot of liquid ambers are dying, oaks, um, pine trees, ashes, from Shamal ashes to Modesto, Arizona ash. Um, yeah, so it's super, super dense here. So, so yeah, a little background. So appreciate that, Brett. The uh, Brett City, the city of Upland was part of the California <laughs> Urban Forest Council's City Forest Renewal Grant, which was a, a CAL FIRE uh, funded grant. And again, like I mentioned at the beginning, one of the deliverables was, you know, removal of, of hazardous trees, um, you know, green to plant, trees and replacements that, that met the criteria, um, but additionally adopting policies and, and actually the city of Upland was the first city to adopt the urban wood policy as, as part of that city forest renewal grant, and really kind of in, almost in California. I'd say Carlsbad adopted a version, but it's a little bit of a different version, but I'd say Upland was the first to adopt uh, the version. So, so Brett, being that you adopted it, um, how does that policy fit into your program and what you do? Sure. Um, doing some research um, when I, we first started working with um, the grant writers and um, Lisette and um, Konami and I think it was David Pineda was helping me originally. And that was an ongoing process. And uh, I was looking back, we only, there was one other version of our um, urban forest management plan. It went back to 1997, literally was written on a typewriter. It was about four or five pages. Um, had very little information, um, very little content, just the basics, and did not have any any recycling uh, plan whatsoever in it. Um, couldn't find a speck of it. Um, a lot of outdated ISA standards weren't even in there. Um, so we we took it and kind of revised it um, and put it a lot of information that was needed in it um, based on the criteria on the grant. Um, and it provide a lot more information and explain what happens uh, to the tree material after it's removed and trimmed. Um, and for a long time, there was a major misconception in this community because it's an older community. Um, senior community um, is a majority of their um, residents. Um, they thought when we remove trees, whether we trim them or remove them, all that wood just goes straight to the to the um, to the landfill. And it's just disregarded. Um, it's definitely not the case. Uh, when we partnered up with um, West Coast Arborist as our tree maintenance contractor, um, they've been here, I believe, a little over 10 years. So they do recycle um, 99. I was did some research as early as, early as this morning. Uh, did some research. Uh, about 99.9% .9 of our removed material is recycled into mulch, wood chips. Uh, utilized back in the landscape, turned into any type of furniture or product uh, imaginable. So um, as a reference, um, we average, uh, we recycle on an average of 300 tons of tree material each year since 2018. Um, and with some of that repurposed wood, we have uh, received many benches, uh, bookshelves, clocks, coat hanger slabs, 
uh, that are currently displayed on our police department, senior center, uh, recreation center, and our public works offices. Um, most of the products, um, the recent ones, the benches we just received, two, uh, three benches uh, about six months ago, those came straight directly from our, our dead liquid amber trees that were removed. Um, I didn't realize that how dense and hardwood that that product is. Um, there's some really nice benches. Um, so a lot of stuff is from liquid ambers, Modesto, Arizona ash, California peppers, if it's usable, uh, silk oaks and live oaks. Um, and I know the street tree revival, uh, where some of these, most of these products are made, um, um, and John can attest to it. He's one of the guys that works in that in that field. Um, houses the great imagination is just unreal, and the vision of their wood products is it's pretty much endless. And uh, I'm kind of excited to see what the future holds for any wood that we can recycle here. Um, they're just a great bunch of guys to work with, and. Uh, Please to be part of the recycling network. Awesome. No, we're, we're grateful for the partnership. You know, going through the process of getting the policy adopted, I mean, there's lots of agency people on this on this presentation that are curious. How did you get it adopted? What did you have to do to, in order to get it through your political channels? And and what what did you call it on, 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 when it went to city council, I guess? Yeah, so... Um... We basically re retitled it uh, Upland City of Upland Urban Forest Management Plan um, that included the recycling. It's near the the end of the the document, um, and I believe it was went from five pages originally. Now it's thirty six. No, sorry, thirty two or thirty four pages. So um, it's pretty extensive with all the information in it. And uh, um, so, like I said, it was outdated. Um, uh, so basically it was reviewed by myself at the beginning um, when we first started the partnership with this to get this uh, revised and reviewed. Um, I went through it with a fine tooth comb, added what I could, had a lot of suggestions from the grant coordinators from uh, the three I mentioned earlier from WCA. Um, they helped me compile it, compile a new version and a new format. Um, and then it was sent to our, my public works manager, who's my boss, he, um, he reviewed it. He made a couple little changes here and there. Um, then it went to our public works director. So as government bureaucracy, it's got to go up the chain. Uh, public works director um, had some questions about it, advised him, um, informed him, and it was kind of a learning curve for him. So it was something new to him. Um, he made his changes, his maybe suggestions. I think he only had a few. Then um, after that, we kept it for a couple months till we had our, our next uh, street tree advisory committee which is an advisory committee we meet with quarterly um, to give them updates on anything that's going on in the city with tree related issues. Um, and then we bring up some topics and this is one of them on our agenda. It's kind of like, it's formatted like a city council meeting, but it's pretty kind of informal, but there we have certain guidelines we have to stick with. And this is one of uh, the agenda items that we brought up and we talked about it for a good hour. And again, they, they reviewed it. They had time to review it, give me, their feedback and we try to input as best we could. Um, a lot of stuff did go in there that they suggested. Um, and then after that, it um, went to our city manager. He reviewed it, um, had no changes, in it, and then we put it on an agenda item for our city council and uh, mayor to adopt. Um, and then uh, that was adopted in April of this year. So um, they had they had a really nice comments to say about it, how professionally it was done, um, how it was compiled and collaborated and the final version was it's really nice so uh, we were uh, really glad to include the recycling that was one of my main things is we got to get some kind of recycling thing in here because there isn't anything i wanted to get that misconception out of the way of hey just go straight to the landfill and um people still ask today um you know why does that go to the dump why is it in a big giant container well where that giant container goes could be either to mulch to uh, repurpose the wood, it's not all. It's nothing's going in the recycling, except maybe the palm fronds, um, if there is any. So can't really recycle those. Um, so yeah, it was a, it was a great project, um, great collaboration, and um, everybody that works at West Coast Arborist is a great bunch of people, and it was great partnership partnership to work with and um, to keep our recycling practices uh, going for the future, even after I retire. 
Awesome. Awesome. You know, I know your policy specifically did have the 1% of new construction is going to utilize urban wood. Has that been enacted since you adopted? Has there been any projects that came about where that requirement came into play? Um, no, there hasn't been any uh, projects yet. Um, there, There is our development services, a different department, but I'm working with them to see if we can possibly give them um, there's going to be a project uh, in the older part of town, and they're going to redevelop um, kind of like not a farmer's market type area like Claremont has, um, but something to that effect. And we're trying to incorporate them with their contractor, their general contractor, and um, more than likely their, um, I guess they're like interior contractor to see if we can get them to use a lot of, um, get them to use more than 1%, obviously, than um, the recycling material that is offered that's out there. Gotcha. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate you being here. I appreciate And uh, Scott, I don't know if Mike, if Mike Bourne is on. Did we get a hold of Mike Bourne? Anybody? I don't see him on here, but I know he was uh, expected to be on this panel as well. I know. I know he's he's watching you. Uh, apparently, you can't see him. No, he's supposed to log in using the link that Deb sent that I resent in an email. If you could ask him to do that, or Mike, if you could do that, log out, log completely out of this meeting, and click on that link. So while while he's doing that, um, I figure maybe Scott, if I could uh, pick your brain for a minute and just um, talk about your your. Uh, global perspective on the urban wood issue. I know you went to, you were in Europe um, during a big summit. Maybe can you talk about what uh, what that experience is, was like? Yeah, when, when I was asked to, um, to look into the viability of urban wood for Taylor Guitars, I, I traveled a lot of the country and I was fortunate enough that the United Nations was having their first ever global conference on urban wood and even more fortunate that it was in Italy. Um, and it was fascinating because there are people from all over the world and I, I have a few slides that I took from that presentation. And if I could show them, I can't, but if I could, the two most interesting are the explosion in interest uh, as expressed through scientific literature in this subject of urban trees. You know, it starts in like 75 and it just kind of peters along, peters along and then about 15 years ago, it explodes uh, in in China and across Europe and, and in South America. But there's not a corresponding interest yet in in urban wood. Everyone at this conference all about we need more trees, we need more canopy, and of course, everyone in this um, call agrees. But it was I was I was a heretic uh, in this crowd when I was asking about well. What about end of life value? What about creating jobs through urban wood utilization? So I think that North America was decades ahead in large part, thanks to the US Forest Service in, in researching the importance of, of the urban canopy and the urban network. Um, and likewise, we're apparently a decade or two ahead of the rest of the world in looking at the waste stream uh, either Andy Trotter or Mike uh, or um, Big John mentioned, you know, it wasn't until the 80s that it even cost anything to dispose of the wood. You, you just, throw, you know, send it to the dump, light it on fire, or push it over the hill. It wasn't an issue. And now disposal of wood, which was never built into the model, is crushing a lot of arborists. So how do we offset that cost of wood disposal and, and obviously building some sort of urban wood economy is fundamentally important. And I think the U.S. is 15 years ahead of the rest of the world in, in exploring this space. Yeah, you definitely bring up a good point. The, uh, the offsetting the costs, I mean, the landfill prices are just going higher and higher. I was uh, out in the desert um, just on Monday and I saw a tipping fee. It was $69 a ton. Well, that, that is that's very what expensive. I yeah, and that's why I kind of laugh a little bit when I, I, it's very understandable why a lot of municipalities would be like, how much are you getting for that tree? You know, isn't that our money? Shouldn't we be in this business? And the thought of a 
uh, municipality running a lumber mill that could service Taylor guitars scares the hell out of me, frankly, that prospect. Um, I'm, I'm happy to see it in the private sector, but one, it's more expensive to get urban wood at the moment because the infrastructure doesn't get exist. No, no one's getting rich off of this. We're frankly spending more money because it's an investment into the future and it's the right thing to do. But additionally, I think municipalities have to realize that arborists are increasingly eating the, um, the cost of disposal that's cutting into their bottom line. So it's not as simple as to say, hey, that's that you're getting a lot of money for that tree over there. You know, that should be our money. It's our tree and not appreciating the, re the escalating costs of disposal and not appreciating that there is no infrastructure in place to bring that wood to market in any mature way. Yep. Yeah. No, it's definitely a, that is a reality. And I think Andy gave the background really well in his presentation before where, you know, it, it's 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 a it's a challenge and and this is a good way to 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 try and do some offset of those costs and um yeah fortunate enough to to be able to acquire some good equipment to do it along the way and we're getting proficient at it but at the end of the day it definitely still costs quite a bit of money to pull off an urban wood operation and um but yeah grateful to have partners like upland and chula vista taylor guitars and then john leading us through the street tree revival and then really nancy with the california urban forest council uh, going after an initiative like this um, city forest renewal grant where, you know, yeah, the, the, they're coming in and, and helping to alleviate some of the pressures of some of these high risk trees that an agency might not be able to afford. But as an exchange for that service, it's a, it's a policy change requirement in order to get that. And um, I think it'll be all the better. And really just to echo what that, it's a little bit beyond just the urban wood is the urban wood recycling. There's plant health care requirement that agencies have to have. There's actually tree care for birds has best management practices that uh, have to be adopted as part of that as well. And then just their overall risk management for trees. So those are like the four main uh, criteria that, that are required in that policy through through that grant. But pretty exciting. And, and again, good partnerships definitely make, make the needle move. And Andy was giving that history. And, and I feel like th this is the next iteration, hopefully in the next I don't know, 10, 10 plus years here, we'll see actively used policies in place being implemented to drive some of the economy that otherwise it's just not gonna exist. And I like Scott's point of it, not just being the live edge stuff, but really just straight up cut wood or even sell logs. You know, logs are attractive if somebody has the ability to, to, to mill them and process them, you know? So there's, uh, there's lots of opportunities there that um, I think are, are untapped just yet. So speaking of untapped opportunities, is Mike Bourne jumping on yet? <laughs> Deb, it says, uh, you said, give me a minute, are we close? He's he's locked off and on three times, he's texted me, so he's having some, some struggles. Some difficulties, okay. All right, Big John. Yes. There we go. So Big John, tell us uh, a little bit about some of the um, cool projects Street Tree Revival has done over the last couple months. Well, we've talked about the Taylor Guitars projects. We've done some um, some interesting where people have just bought kind of character logs too, and they put them in as um, centerpieces in like a, like kind of like a sculpture. Also, one of the main ones we're doing lately, is like uh, that Brett was talking about, just out or that Brett made me think about when he was talking about redoing this outdoor area with the. We've been doing big log benches. Where we cut the top off the bent, off the log, and off the bottom, and we kind of get to use large cat, you know, large timbers, and get to recycle a lot of material by using it as a big bench. So we've done a lot of cool projects for the LAUSD, where they're taking out asphalt and they're planting a tree and kind of making outdoor classrooms, and that's been a really fun way to utilize uh, some large pieces. Another one, we get the, you know, California, we got the some of the problems are. If you try to salvage all the logs, you got these gargantuous logs, sometimes really hard to break down and process into material, and especially eucalyptus, right? We get these like eight foot wide, 10 foot wide eucalyptus. Well, recently, we sold a couple of slices off of those eucalyptus to the Santa Ana Zoo. They put one inside the monkey uh, enclosure and one outside the monkey enclosure so the monkeys can sit on the logs and look at each other. 
Also flooring, we've done some cool projects for some architects where they're uh, utilized uh, blue gum eucalyptus as flooring product and done a lot of architectural millwork uh, out of red gum eucalyptus. One guy in particular, Pat Bernatz, is, is uh, hopping on that train, so it's very cool. A lot of, I mean, you're only limited by your imagination. I love that saying. I love that saying. Um, if I could get everybody to turn their cameras on, I guess, you know, since we are a panel, maybe um, that might be good. So if you could all turn your cameras on, that was a, a, a Nancy request. I want to make sure I fulfill our obligations here as a, as a, as a panel. Um, so um, trying to brainstorm here on uh, killing time until Mike gets on. So any other stories, narratives, uh, what we're doing with urban wood? Um, I know down in uh, Chula Vista, there's San Diego Urban Timbers as a pretty active uh, urban wood reutilization program. Um, Alex, do you interact with them much? No, I'm not. Uh, I've, only, I've only spoken to her a couple of times, or the company uh, okay. uh, manager there a couple of times. Uh, um, but uh, they seem to be happy with what, whatever uh, uh, WCA uh, sends them. So. Yeah, I mean, that's all, all, what's that saying? All rising tides, all boats rise, right? So that's. Right. The goal is to help us support their organization and, and help them do the wood. And I see we got Mike on. So Finally. thank you, thank you, Mike, for getting through the technology hurdles. <laughs> so, um, Mike, I've got some questions for you. So, Mike, why, first of all, let's start off. Who is Mike Bourne? Can you tell us a little bit about you? Um, let's see. I'm probably the exact opposite of everybody else on this uh, call. So I have a degree in wood science and technology. That makes me unique, I think, right there from Colorado State. I've been in the industrial side of the hardwood market for 40 plus years. So I started in distribution, but I've worked in um, the sawmill side of it. I currently work for four sawmills, a couple of large landowners, some foreign companies, helping them develop their sawmills, their dry kilns. I think I developed my first and designed my first dry kiln in 1981, and I've probably done a dozen kilns since then. So I got into this completely accidentally when I was at Fender Guitar as the wood buyer or director of wood technology to be more specific. Uh, one of the things that I was faced with was the huge timber loss in the eastern two thirds of the United States due to emerald ash borer, ash being a major species that we used at Fender. So I really got into, I think the urban side of it as urban trees started being removed from especially the southeastern Michigan area originally knowing that was going to eventually affect our our wood base in the mississippi river bottoms i started working with the u.s forest service on developing a genetically resistant true american green ash species which it took several years forest service did that at delaware ohio and i worked with washington dc in the forest service to actually get those seedlings as a pilot program planted in detroit this year so on top of that, some other urban trees that we're, we've been missing due to invasive species and pests are things like Dutch elm disease, um, resistant elm, butternut, things like that. So I kind of came at it from that perspective. And because of that, the U.S. Forest Service tagged myself and my partner in our nonprofit urban wood economy, a guy named Jeff Carroll, to help municipalities develop a, a re uh, really a return uh, a recycling program for not just their urban trees, but their urban wood waste. So it started in Baltimore with deconstruction of buildings. So why in the world would the cities be interested in doing this? You know, right now it all went to landfill. It's a bigger problem east of Mississippi than it is out here. But part of this is workforce development is what's in in our charter is putting people to work, training people in this industry to take buildings down and, and reutilize that material. And it started with deconstruction of homes, which the home structures that were built in the pre-war areas east of the Rocky Mountains, I would say, really lend themselves well to that. But that sort of moved into the next category, which was what do we do with tree removal? And it's it's not as big a problem in California as it is in, uh, in the East. Let's face it, cars have been around and are, and are a big part of life in, in the larger cities east of the, in the Eastern US. So as those trees mature, both here and in Europe, 
more and more being removed. It, it seems like a, a problem out here, but to put it in perspective, approximately 4 billion board feet of trees are removed out of urban areas per year. That's more than is cut in hardwood on all national forest property every year. That's a lot, that's a crazy stat. So the Forest Service is saying, what in the world are we going to do? We can't keep putting these in landfills. Now, this group that's on this phone call actually is starting to chip away at that. But I can tell you right now that if you took all of us together and multiplied it by a million, we wouldn't touch that 4 billion board foot number. So looking at it from some of the cities that we work in, in, the, in and around the US, we're in Baltimore, we work in Philadelphia, we're just starting in Memphis, we're in Pittsburgh, Detroit, St. Louis. These all sort of have that combination. And really what it, what it boils down to is what is done out here is completely different than how it's handled uh, in, the, in the bigger cities in the East. So we have to kind of look and develop a plan that works for each individual regional area. The ownership of the trees, while it always starts with the city, what we found is that most of the actual tree ownership in, in most urban areas is about 10 to 15% owned by city. It's really private ownership that will have to drive this. So how do you get, how do you combine both public and private um, an issue here where you've got the trees all going in through one facility. And it really needs to kind of start with the cities because that's the one largest single landowner generally. The issues that we run into is when you're on in say Memphis is that the trees are owned by the city and they're removed by the city. So how do you value that? How do you put, bring in is, is it, uh, should the public get money back from that? Is the savings of not going to the landfill sufficient? Is the workforce development enough to drive it? And can we drive it enough through large slabs, as you see out here? Or really is the big volume, which everybody here kind of knows that answer, in the rest of the trees? So if we look at it, I'll, I'll use Memphis, for instance, because we're probably a little bit more familiar, at least I am with the issue there, large trees, um, probably eight or 10 species make up the entire city, but they're gigantic trees. So uh, um, you, you need to find a way to turn that large slab, which is the biggest money maker. You need to cut those as required, but you really need an industrial sawmill to be able to cut that large volume of lumber. That's probably about five to 10 times the volume of what would realistically make good slabs. Well, how do you market that? First, you have to have kiln capacity. So we've arranged for kiln capacity in a city like Memphis where we can dry upwards of a million feet a year. That's kind of the key in every city is how do you get it dried? But also marketing it, we need to look at large manufacturers. If we've got 10 species and let's say the majority of it is five, you need to move some large volumes to some large manufacturers. What they're looking for is consistency. So let's say we sell them um, a certain grade that we come up with. We need to have a consistent grade for them to use from any one of the cities that cuts. Let's take White Oak, for example. We need to take it to a, a consumer like Room and Board and say, not only can we get you the 20 to 30 to 40,000 feet per month from Memphis, but we will grade the exact same species in St. Louis and Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, Baltimore, Cleveland, Detroit, and Chicago the exact same way. So now instead of having available to you 20,000 feet a month, you have 200,000 feet a month and they can build a business around those volumes. So it's gotta be really built much like an industrial sawmill and then have the other businesses feed off of it. Because if you can't move that large volume of material, you're still gonna end up putting 90% of that wood back into the landfill. Obviously the bottom 50%, which is at a sawmill used to fire things like, like uh, boilers to power your kilns or to produce electricity, that goes into mulch. Well, that all ends up getting put back into the atmosphere within a couple of years, mulch quickly degrades. So we're trying to work on things like biochar, which has a much longer carbon storage life there. At the end of the day, what we want to do is find either those for-profit or non-profit entities that can turn a profit on that and put that money back into 
tree planting. And I think I, I loved what I heard Matt Ritter say earlier today. I think it's not just tree planting. It's got to be trees that are designed to be in that area based on things like climate change, um, the fact that native species in particular um, aren't invasive. We've got a lot of issues in North America with invasive species that are brought in diseases. Emerald ash borer is just the tip of the iceberg. Dutch elm disease is one. There's a disease that's come in here that actually affects avocado. Now those industries can put money to, to uh, fight these diseases, but urban trees, it's not so much that way. And while we lost a lot of ash trees in the United States, the presentation that I made in Washington, D.C. to the Forest Service only only took in what we know in the United States in the Canadian cities, which Canada and US look, the trees don't know which side of the border they're on because ash is a great street tree. It's 80% of the street trees in a city like Quebec City and Montreal. So we've got to be able to hedge our bet. We've got to have locally grown trees to put back in. And that's really what the, our, our function is to have that full circular economy work for each individual regional area based on what they should do. So workforce development, a powerful part here where we're taking people that are underemployed or unemployed, giving them skills and putting them back into the workforce and then retraining more people. That kind of takes it in, in the big picture of what we do and starts to deal with this 4 billion board feet per year that we're looking at. And that doesn't even count deconstruction materials, which doesn't make any sense to take pine from old houses and put that in a landfill either. So I think some of our focus will be developing grading standards, much like the National Hardwood Lumber Association has done for their associate mills, so that they can sell a consistent product anywhere in the world. And the end consumer knows that number one common from a, saw, a sawmill in Mississippi is the same as number one common from a sawmill in Pennsylvania as number one common from Wisconsin. And a manufacturer in Germany can use it from each person knowing it will be approximately the same product. I think that's the consistency. That's the volume that needs to drive this in every city. I think the boutique pro um, products like slabs will change. Those won't always be in vogue. I think Scott sort of touched on that. That's, that's a cool thing right now. They, they look awesome. But what happens when that isn't the driving market? Right, right. Um, Rick, you said quite a bit there, you may have covered this, but the ownership issue, what's your thoughts on how to address, especially with the consideration that you said, statistically, the majority of the, um, it's private property, the, the wood itself. What's your thoughts on the ownership issue there? Well, I think what we're seeing in uh, Memphis is actually a really good blueprint for what we'd like to see. And we, we can start with a group like, um, uh, Cambium Carbon was on this phone call earlier. I don't know if they are this afternoon. But to get in a national entity like that, that can start that sawmill, that can have that marketing arm to be able to move that volume, knows how the operation should work. Um, that's a great start, but I'd like to see, I think the blueprint really needs to be that there is a local, either for-profit or non-profit that's philanthropic, that is locally driven. I think these businesses all need to have a local, um, main driver to them. In Memphis, it's fairly easy because we've got a lot of large corporate sponsors, believe it or not, in Memphis that are very interested in this. Companies like Holiday Inn Hotels are based there. FedEx is based there. So you've got a lot of big corporate sponsors that would like to be part of this. I think every city has that, but until they kind of see that the operations work and that and that the full circular economy in them is working, it's hard to get that initial investment. That's why somebody that has that experience, like a Cambium, is a great initial investor in there. But I think long term, to take that capital that they put into each market, the best idea is for them to take that, sell to a local entity, and move on to the next city and reinvest that capital. You mentioned long term. So what would the, um, you know, we have replanting, climate change, native versus non-native, end of use life. What's the what's the long term vision based on this urban wood economy? What's, what's your vision there? Well, I, I think the long term vision is that realistically, this really doesn't need to be any different than than managing a natural forest. It's very similar, other than street trees need to be a, a bit different species mix because not every tree that's in the forest does well in an urban area. 
Ash does well because it survives well in very poor growing conditions, and that's why it's a major street tree. However, when you see that 80% of the trees in a city like Montreal are one species, that's a problem that every city has fallen into at some point. Now, if that mistake was made 70 years ago, it's a little tough to correct it. But I grew up in southern Michigan, so I saw a town where elm trees, American elm trees, were the majority of the trees. They all died off. Those were replanted with ash trees. Those have now all been killed off. So you've got to have a great mix of species. It, it looks great if you're a landscape architect to plant the same tree up and down the street. But realistically, there's a reason Mother Nature doesn't do that. Right. No, that diversity is key, 100 percent. Mother Nature knows best. Diversity. Um, and I think really the trees that were meant to be in that area naturally are also a, 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 something that needs to be really looked at. So when I was in Detroit looking to plant the ash trees, one thing we found out there is as the city of Detroit replants 10,000 trees a year, zero of the nursery stock is from Michigan trees. They all come from New Jersey. So the trees already have three, two strikes against them. They're not native to that area. So how well are they going to do, especially as climate change continues to be a bigger and bigger issue, is hard to say. I, obviously, trees will adjust to climate change. Climate right. will kill kill the ones that don't do well there. But they should all have a, a local flavor to what's being grown in the nurseries. And the only way you can do that is start today. Yep, no doubt. Um, who should own these these processing companies in your mind? We got NGOs, we got profit companies, we got agencies. Who's the what group is the ideal owner in your mind? Well, my my perspective probably is a little bit different in that I think these tend to flourish best when they're for profit. I, I think initially they probably need to be a combination of, of nonprofit and profit. But I think the long term vision really me, needs to be for profit. I think that's the only way that they flourish. Gotcha. You, you tend to keep reduced costs. I think part of what's helped us in Baltimore is that the city partially funds the workforce development. So rather than have somebody be incarcerated and it's costing them X number, you know, say $50,000 a year is take half that money, pay part of their wages, have the business pay the other part. Now that person doesn't go back into jail. They now start paying taxes as they get a skill and get back into the worst workforce. And the recidivism rate that we've had in Baltimore drops from an average of 60% if they don't go through the program to less than 3% if they do. So I think that that's really where the city tends to gain in this is that you take somebody off being an expense to now being a contributor to the general tax base. Absolutely. Absolutely. Job creation, I think, is an awesome outcome of this entire movement. And if everything goes according to the way policies are written and the way plans are designed, I think uh, it's a lot of answers to a lot of challenges. Um, so thank you, Mike. I'm glad we got the technology glitches worked out. And um, I guess I'm going to open it up to everybody. If you have any questions, you can type them in the chat. Um, I don't know, Jennifer, if you want to jump on and kind of chime in a little bit on a wrap up. But again, I just thank you guys for being here. Thank you for contributing to this. And I think uh, this is the type of momentum we need to, to make change. And I feel like that's where we're heading. So um, I'm going to hand it back to Jennifer and, and Nancy, if you guys want to jump on. There you go, Jennifer. I saw you there. You're muted. Sorry for a second. <laughs> hey, Mike, while you're waiting, I'm going to fill yeah. the space with just a, a Go for it. revisiting the concept of contract growing um, in, in the fundamental importance of contract growing for where we are right now. Um, you've got folks like Matt Ritter who are doing a great job uh, coming up with a list of appropriate trees for the state. The problem is when it comes time to plant those trees, the nurseries don't have those trees. So we need to shift to an ability to do contract growing so that various groups like Tree San Diego down here and others, we have the ability to plant the trees we want to plant, not the trees that just happen to be available at that time. Absolutely. And uh, again, that, that end of use life analysis, um, the more we think about it, the more full use those trees will get from the benefits they're going to provide while they're alive to the 
potential guitars and other cool things that will be utilized out of that wood. So I, cool. I would I would add to that, Scott, that was part of our emerald ash borer resistant ash planting that we did in Detroit is that the bigger picture is that behind the first several hundred seedlings that we planted this year were another an additional thousand which we gave to the city of Detroit and they built their own nursery and they are starting to build nursery stock out of that strain of ash to be able to start to not just plant city trees, but then to sell those off to the other governmental areas around there. And from that, that's going to then go to private ownership. So I think it was the overall vision. That's part of the reason the Forest Service funded it was that this is sort of the, maybe the way to, to start to change that a little bit. Very cool. All right. Again, thank you guys. Appreciate it, Nancy and Jennifer. You guys are muted, by the way, Nancy and Jennifer. Quick, find a 20 year old. <laughs> I do have tree jokes. What did the beaver say to the tree? It's been nice. It's been nice gnawing you. <laughs> How did the tree get onto the internet? It logged in. These are these are perfect for second graders, by the way. Um, why, why did the tree go to the doctor? It was feeling green. Um, what did the tree wear to the swim party? His trunks. Trunk, yes. Hey, Mike, uh, Mike, you should be on, on mute. Uh, I should be on mute. I'd be better, yes. Um, what was my, I have another one. Um, well, what kind of tree fits in your hand? Uh, uh, palm. A palm tree. Come on. <laughs> yes, I need to mute myself and turn my camera off here pretty soon. All right, Nancy. You're still muted. <laughs> you know, no, Mike, one thing I'll, I'll add here, actually, when I worked at, at uh, Fender, some of these reclaimed wood projects actually go worldwide. Um, we've done, I did with Bob Taylor years ago, down timber from Hurricane Lily, which hit Southern Belize. We brought an American group down there, logged and rebuilt uh, villages and, and roads down there for three years while we brought down trees out and turned them into product. Wow. Um, at Fender, we used the old seats from the Hollywood Bowl to make guitars rather than throw them in the dump. Uh, the, any, if anybody here has heard about the Old Globe grain elevators up on Lake Superior, the largest wooden structure in the United States at one point that stored grain for the cereal companies, when they tore those down, we made several thousand guitars out of that. And wow. currently, I just finished a reclaimed wood project in northern Italy out of a little valley called Val de Fiemme, which doesn't mean anything to anybody here. But if you've ever heard of a Stradivarius violin, that is the little forest that Antonio Stradivari got the spruce from for his famous violins. Wow. So... We sold, I sold that in to Fender, and they actually worked with a uh, violin maker with the New York Philharmonic named Joshua Bell, who owns the Red Stradivarius violin, valued at about $14 million. And they rebuilt guitars based off of that violin's appearance. So all that was, was meant to go into landfills around the world that all got turned into products. It's just being creative with it and looking outside the box a little bit and seeing what you can do to not only reuse that wood, but I think retell the stories of the history of some of those pieces of wood besides just the urban trees, but they have their own history as well. Yeah, including a potential to become a $14 million <laughs> urban, urban wood utilized product. That's exactly. Uh, that's a pretty good ROI. Not bad. <laughs> yeah, not bad at all. For about $10 um, worth of wood. That's pretty awesome. We need more stories like that. We need more stories like that. And I think that's a lot of what the, the grant, the City Forest Renewal Grant is trying to just create some stories with the urban wood that gets recycled, that a lot of these trees that were taken down for that grant got turned right into products, brought right back to the cities to really tell the story of what's possible. 
And uh, from a $14 million guitar to a conference room table to a cool bench to a carving, it's, there's just so many unique opportunities that come from it. So very cool. Nancy, Jennifer, you're muted on some camera. You want to unmute somewhere? Can you hear us now? Yes. The technology is moving all <laughs> over the place. So we did not have the ability to unmute ourselves. So we're we're having we're, we're having to wait on other people to do it, and and uh, technology is failing us today. So. Well, you're good now. I can hear you. Good. Good. Yeah, well, you're hearing me through a computer, not through the mics. <laughs> but hey, you're, you're hearing us. Um, Very cool. I, I agree, uh, Mike Boren, when you had mentioned uh, private sector, I 100% agree. If uh, love nonprofits, directing one, Nancy's directing one, but if we don't get the ingenuity and innovation of, of the private sector, of the entrepreneurs, it's not going to have the longevity and the sustainability that it needs to have. So I 100% agree, definitely in support of that. Um, one of the things, uh, if anyone else has any input on uh, a question that was asked earlier, uh, uh, and I don't know if it was a private chat or on the, on the main forum, but a question that was asked earlier on how do the cities get to a point where they stop going oh this needs the, uh, we, we need to sell this to the private sector and then all of a sudden it's it's priced out of you know of anybody being able to use it so what what's uh, what's each of the, the i know we have two cities represented here how did you overcome those obstacles in your in your cities if you could explain that just a little bit deeper and i know we kind of touched but but just a little deeper on those Brett, you want to go first? Yeah, um, I don't think we had an issue with, well, we, the only issue we kind of encountered was, hey, we have a tree contractor, they're removing dead trees. Um, there's a lot of wood there. What are they doing with it? Are they, there was a lot of misconceptions that they were making products and they were selling it and making a profit. And we're like, well, no, they do, they're reutilizing and recycling the, the material, but what, the cost of making that is offsetting what they make, so they're not making a profit. It's just, it's a it's a win win for everybody. Um, so that was a big misconception: is why are they taking our property or our our tree asset and making money off it? So we kind of had to um, educate the public um, in a way where we didn't make them. We made them realize, hey, they're not making a profit. It's nonprofit, um, and just get that misconception out there that it kind of it's subsided quite a bit since we've gotten that information out. Um, I believe so we even it, put a little blurb on our website about it too. And education, uh, how did you disseminate that information to them that made them feel more comfortable with it? Was was it um, uh, public meetings or? Yeah, we did a, well, we did a workshop when we invited the public. Unfortunately, not a lot of people came. It was kind of during the, the COVID time at uh, one of our, our, our library. Um, we did a big workshop there and uh, uh, David Pineda, he, he was one of the grant coordinators there. He did a presentation about um, the, the management plan and included the recycling, explained that real quick. Um, so um, that's the only way we did that. And then we could put banners up on our website um, for the public to see, but uh, I think they might even put that everything on social media for people just to view too. Yeah. So, so some different campaigns, different strategies. Yeah. Great, thank you. All right, and if I could mention something um, that Mike brought up about the wholesale uh, tree nursery industry, I think we all know that they're going to grow what they can sell. So um, until we're thoroughly educating the end users on the right reasons, you know, right tree, right place, right tree, right place, right reason, we're still going to push that rock up the hill, and we have been doing that for ever. So it, it could take a real concerted, organized effort around that messaging for, you know, their money too. So, um, but they also want to do the right thing. So I think we have. Uh, opportunity and obligation there. 
in our next city, what was what was your uh, experience with with the uh, asset versus resource, and and what what value should be associated to that monetarily? We actually haven't gotten to that point. We're still kind of working out the uh, the logistics of stakeholders and and who we can uh, get involved and we in a way it's kind of opening up a can of worms uh with our development services because uh we're still seeing a great deal of growth in the city of chula vista so we're we're constantly uh expanding our staff but it's it's one of those things if we get if we if we get more things on their plate with respect to trying to uh, police what trees are being removed, uh, not what trees are being removed, but what happens uh, to the valuable wood that that could get a little bit of a, a kickback uh, internally. So we're just we're right now we're just focusing and making sure that the wood that is salvaged uh, for other repurposing is either taking taken to one of the local vendors uh that will generate tax revenue for the city and that at the same time uh if it's going elsewhere that it is going to be repurposed but we haven't r really focused on uh a monetary value for for the wood specifically great all right let's see if we have a new chat i just heard something pop up um nope hold on i was John Melvin likes the Star Wars collection in the background, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Well, those were those were the only questions I saw. Unless someone sees something else, um, I think everything else was for the other sections. That was really informative. Uh, I I know a lot of people uh, chimed in for this section just to get ideas for how to implement an urban wood recycling policy in their own areas, and so it's really really good to hear from those that are actually doing it and and bringing it together don't forget uh, for those of you who uh, that we do have those handouts out there if you want to see in writing some of the some of the things that they've been working on as well and that so. does include the policy we've been referring to that um, such as the city of yes. upland for example so you can see um, you know, at least what we what we take to them in order uh, to have the conversation to help you know change the um, the direction for and, they're, and they're templates so they can be yeah. manipulated based upon your specific needs but it gives you a place to start and that's what so many people are looking for is just where do we start how do we get going and it's really well done i didn't do it <laughs> i'm not taking credit <laughs> for it um others did and it's, it's excellent and it even the uh, the insurance uh, world ha is part of this and you know they have the big responsibility in many cases of so uh, paying for the liability cities incur when a tree causes a problem you know whether you know falls on a car or hurts a pedestrian so there's a lot of really good stuff in there so have a look yes absolutely yep. all right if there's anybody any other cities that um, are going to adopt a policy if they need any help or any advice um, i can help them as best i can if they want my information uh, feel free to given my information, I have no problem helping anybody else out, so. Yes, thank you so much for that. That's, yeah. that's great. I don't know if his contact information's out there, but if not, email me and I will make sure that you get it. So, and that's info at urbansalvagedwoods.com. Okay, any last questions, comments? Fabulous panel, don't let yes, them go away <laughs> and leave a question on the table. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Mike, thank, thank you. you. Great thank you so organizing, much. great facilitating. Yeah, appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.